We've been in a series called Back to the Oh, we got some social people in here, Back to the Basics. And we've been looking at the book of Romans, the book of Romans. We have been going almost chapter by chapter. And I told you that Romans, whoo, it is the AP chapter of the Bible. Okay, it is not kibbles and bits. It is filet mignon. Amen. It is some real stuff in the book of Romans. But since it's a pop-up service, everybody say pop-up. pop-up. Come on, social at home, say pop-up. Since it's a pop-up, I figured, you know, can I take a little break from Romans? And do just a little pop-up message. Is that cool? It's, it's still going to be in the series Back to the Basics. But just, just a little pop-up. Just a little pop-up uh, message. I want to go to the Gospel of Mark tonight. Mark chapter 4. And I want to look at verses 1 through 13. The Gospel according to Mark. Chapter number 4. We'll start at verse number 1 and we'll land at verse number 13. How many of you got a Bible at the pop-up? Can I see you? Come on, come on. Look at, look at the paper Bibles. Ooh, I love it. Those are the saved folks. Those are the saved folks. It's all right if your Bible's glowing. I'm not judging. I'm not judging. Mark chapter 4. And would you mind, can we stand to honor the reading of God's word? If you want to stand up after this, that's on you. Mark chapter 4. Start at verse number 1. And we'll land right around verse number 13. When you're ready to read it, say, oh, I'm ready. If you're not ready and you need a little time, say, can I get just a little time? Oh, y'all ready? It says, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Uh, Would you just look at the person next to you and say, it's time for you to stop being shallow. Yeah, that, that, that would be a message by itself, but that's not what I want to talk about. <laughs> Verse 6 says, But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30 and some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, his classic closing line, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. Pause. I got to let you know what's going on. This trips me out because Jesus is doing his classic teaching method. He tells a story. And the crowd is looking perplexed, trying to figure it out. But what trips me out is not the crowd. His disciples didn't have a clue what he was talking about either. But they didn't have the nerve to ask him while the crowd was around. So you know why he was teaching, they're like, hmm, that's good. Peter, I love when he teaches like this. And once the crowd left, then they said, hey, Jesus, um, what was that about? What? Uh, <laughs> Can you break that thing down? It just it makes me laugh because I think a lot of people like that in the church. You shout and say amen about stuff. You don't even know what you're saying amen about. But I love that Jesus has grace and he got him alone. And once they got alone, they asked him, hey, what, what, was that, what was that story about? And he told him, look at what he told them. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? In other words, if you don't get this story, you won't get any story that I tell. Then he lets them know the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. The secret, the secret. I want to preach tonight for about six hours using this as a title, The Best Kept Secret. The Best 
kept secret. Look at your neighbor for what might be the last time and just say, neighbor, it's all about the best kept secret. Look at your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Can you keep a secret? Wait and see what they say and then tell them your deepest, darkest secret real quick. Tell them, tell them, tell them. <laughs> Oh, Father, have your way. Thank you for this social pop-up. Thank you for social at home. Speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The best kept secret. I should say just at the onset, this vision of pop-ups, we're going to keep doing this throughout the year. It kind of started by accident. We're going to start popping up in different cities. How many think that would be dope? Just... Without announcement, just pop up. In fact, if you're watching online, put that in the chat. Whatever city you want us to pop up in, let us know. Waxahachie, uh, Frisco, uh, Oak Cliff, Forney, Forney. <laughs> I'm playing. We ain't popping up in Forney. We're not popping up in Forney. <laughs> uh, the best kept secret. Social fam, I, I should let you know that long before... I was ever called to preach the gospel. I was always fascinated with preaching, always been drawn to preaching. I've always been mesmerized by a man or a woman of God who would stand flat footed behind the circular table, or behind the pulpit and preach the word of God. I've always been fascinated by people who could take truth that comes from this book that seems so antiquated. I mean, full of these and thou's and shall nots and words that look like diseases sometimes. <laughs> Starting the sermon and you're looking at them going, this ain't got nothing to do with my life. What is this about? But if the preacher was good, by the end of the message, your bottom lip is quivering and you look like a hurricane hit your face and all your Mary Kay and Mac makeup is jacked up. And now you go, I didn't know that he knew what I was going through. God, did you tell him what I was going through? I've always been fascinated with people that have the ability to effectively communicate the infallible, incorruptible, everlasting, unchanging word of God. This started when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I was the kid that would be on the edge of my seat when somebody was preaching, and I would be taking scrupulous notes over every single thing they were saying. I would write down what illustrations were connecting. I would write down what they were doing good, Ooh, and I would write down what they were doing bad. I loved watching preachers. If they dropped the SAT word that I didn't know, I would go home and I would Google and research the word and find out what Google wasn't around, but I would search in the dictionary to find out the word because I've always been fascinated with preaching. And then imagine whoo, when I discovered Christian television. Ooh, I'm that kid. I'm that kid. I was not on ESPN. I was on TV yeah. watching preachers on TV. I was always drawn to it. I remember the first time I saw Billy Graham preaching in a crusade stadium packed with people and he's standing there with all the unction and the anointing in his voice. He said, I tell you now, you're a sinner and you need to come to Jesus. And by the end of the message, they start playing, just as I am. And thousands of people would flood the altar. I remember this, watching this, but I will never forget the day. I'm perusing through the TV, and I stopped on Christian television, and I'm watching a preacher that I had never seen before. I had never seen anybody preach like this man. I'll never forget what he was wearing. He had on a white suit. He was preaching with power. He was preaching and making the word of God come alive. I've never seen anybody preach like this. Every word out of his mouth would slap me in the face. The whole place was going crazy while he was preaching. And then about halfway through his message, I'd never seen him before, but he started saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And the whole place just went crazy and lost their mind. And imagine, imagine my shock when at the end of his preaching, it said, that was Bishop T.D. Jakes. And this church is the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas. Yo, I'm a kid. I'm a teenager. I'm like, what? The teeth in my city? Are you saying? I called my mom. True story. I said, you got to take me. You got to take me to this Potter's House. I've got to see him preach. We stood in line, crowds of people to watch 
him preach. And in my humble opinion, he is still the GOAT, still the greatest orator. However, I do want to share with you tonight, there's actually another preacher who is the greatest. Ooh, forgive me for saying this, but there's a preacher here in this room that transcends Billy Graham, transcends Bishop Jakes. The preacher is here. In fact, I want us to all stand, if we can, to honor the preacher. Would you all stand? I want us to honor the better than Bishop, better than Billy Graham, greatest orator. Everybody stand, everybody stand, because I want to honor this preacher. Y'all stand it? Everybody? You ready? Who? You waiting for me to announce somebody, right? I wish I had a mirror. Because if I had a mirror, I would just put it in your face. Because you are the greatest preacher that you will ever hear. You are the greatest communicator that you will ever hear. Stay standing, even at home, because I want this to hit you in the face. Because I've learned that the most powerful voice is not the voice that is declaring to you through this microphone. It is the voice that is in your head. I'm beginning to find out that the most powerful preacher is not the preacher that is telling you, yes, you can be all that God has called you to be. It is the voice in your head that seems to refute and knock down every single thing that I'm saying to you. I could be preaching down fire, saying you're called for a purpose. You can do what God has called you to do. But if the voice in your head is louder, yeah. saying no, you can't. Not, not in your family. No, no, no not, not, you're too old. You're, you're too young. You're too black. You're too white. No, you, not, not your gender. If, if that voice is louder, it will not matter what I'm saying. And none of this will be effective. You can sit down. You can sit down. It, it helps me today to know that you can be preaching the gospel and be preaching effectively. And its connection is not just predicated upon you. It's also predicated upon the listener. And sometimes people tell me, ooh, that's the best message you ever preach. And I'm thinking to myself, no, it's not. That's the best time you ever listen. Because if you're not receptive to hear, you won't be able to receive. This is actually the power of this text today. It is showing me that Jesus, who, by the way, who the greatest orator and the greatest preacher to ever preach. You know Jesus was the greatest. You know he was because he was the word made flesh. He was the word. You know, oh, he didn't even have to open up his mouth to preach. He could just. That's good preaching. When you just show up and you're still preaching. But even Jesus did not have a 100% success rate with his audience. He knew that he would be saying powerful things. He was the word made flesh. And he would still have to follow up every single sermon with he who has an ear. Let him hear. It almost seems like a silly statement because you would think if you would have an ear, you would hear. But Jesus understood there's a difference between hearing and listening. And this is what's happening in my text today. Can I take my time? The Bible says that Jesus is starting to preach and a crowd, a multitude of people had, has gathered so large a number, there's not even enough land mass for him to stand on. So he goes out into the boat and he sits in the boat and he now uses the sound waves of the water to be his own PA system. And he uses the acoustics of the water to preach to the people who had crowded to hear his words. Jesus was a powerful communicator. And I love this because this text not only gives me insight to preaching, it gives me insight to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Because how many of you know, we find out some things about his preaching. First thing I notice about his preaching is that every time he was preaching, he preached about one topic, the kingdom of God. Every single sermon series, kingdom of God kingdom of God. He, he never preached a message on deliverance. He just delivered people. He never preached a message on healing. He just healed people. He never preached seven steps on how to get rid of a demon. No, just one step. Come out. <laughs> and was chill with it too. You know, we look like we're doing an exercise video when we try to get a demon out. In the name of Jesus, come out. 
come out, come out. Then we get tired. We tag team the next person. You pray. I can't get down. <laughs> but you know, Jesus was so cool with it. Said, come on out. Quit playing. Come out. Everything you always preached was always about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, always preaching about the kingdom. And then we get inside in Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 8, and we read in Mark chapter 4 that every time he told a sermon, it was always in a story. It was always a parable. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story that is articulating a heaven reality. A heavenly reality. He's telling you something that you can't understand so that you somehow comprehend something that you could never understand. And every time he spoke to the crowd, he was always telling a parable, a story. The word parable, para, actually means to come alongside. So he would use a story to come alongside this heavenly principle that he was trying to get in your head. And every, every time he spoke, every time, whoo, story. And he would always end the story with, he who has an ear, let him hear. Can you imagine if every time I preached, I just told you a story? And then just ended it with, he who has an ear, let him hear. I'm curious to think whether we would actually like Jesus preaching if he showed up. Because every time he preached to the crowd, story, closing, he who has an ear, let him hear. I'm going to really bring this text to life to you today. And I want to tell you a story. This is what it would be like to hear Jesus preach. Can I tell you a story? Once upon a time, there was a bird that was flying and got caught in the middle of a snowstorm. And this bird got caught in a snowstorm. All of a sudden, the snow fell on this little bird's wings. It melted quickly and then froze, causing this little bitty bird to plummet from the sky down into an open field. The bird sat there, shivering, freezing encased in ice, thinking, this is it. This is how I'm going out. I'm going to die. Right in that moment, a cow that was in the field wandered over to where the bird was and made a deposit of manure on this frozen bird. Immediately, the bird was like, are you serious? I was already going to die cold and being frozen and now I gotta deal with this manure on me but the manure had warmth and slowly the warmth began to thaw out its frozen wings as it began to throw out its frozen wings all of a sudden the bird began to feel its wings again it started getting excited because it knew its impending freedom was there it started chirping chirp chirp chirp, chirp. it started praising chirp 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 in fact it was a bird so it started tweeting tweet 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 however in the middle of the tweeting in the middle of the chirping all of a sudden a cat in the field drawn by the chirping and the tweeting went all the way up to the bird, dug it out of the manure, and ate it. He who has an ear. Let him hear. God bless you. It's been so good. That's what it was like to hear Jesus preach. He would hit you with the story. No worship team. No altar call. He who has an ear. Let him hear. Can you, can you imagine if I ended the night just like that? What would you do? Most of y'all be like, well, all right, I guess that was it. Uh, <laughs> Raising Cane's Taco Bell. Where y'all trying to come? <laughs> Stay with me. But imagine, imagine with me tonight if there was just one of you that that story, you could not get it out of your head. Everybody else went out to eat, but just one, let me just pick a person right here, Manny, Pastor Manny. He's like, I can, y'all, go to, y'all go eat at Taco Bell. I got to figure out, what is that story about? Yeah. What, what? Wait, the snowstorm with a bird? The cow with the manure? The cow? I, 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 I got to find out what it is. 
Manny is obsessed with finding out the answer. The rest of y'all went out to eat. Manny is so obsessed. He says, I, 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 gotta, I gotta get to Pastor Robert. I gotta find out, I gotta find out. But he doesn't know where I live. He doesn't know where I live. So he starts calling people. Do you know where Pastor Robert lives? Do you know where Pastor, I gotta find out about this story. I cannot sleep. I got to figure out this story. He's calling people to find out where I live, but nobody knows where I live. He finally, after calling a whole bunch of people, finds out where I live. And somebody tells him my address. He finds the address, gets in his car, is driving there, but on the way there, whoo, his car breaks down. He didn't put no gas in it. He's like, oh my goodness, I gotta go home. No, 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 I gotta know what that story is about. So he calls an Uber, calls an Uber, gets an Uber all the way to my house. But when he gets to my house, ding dong, I'm not there. And he's just outside the front of my house going, I ain't leaving. I ain't leaving until he comes back home. I tell you, I'm not leaving. I gotta find out about that story. I'm not leaving. I'm, he gets indignant about it. I ain't leaving. I ain't leaving. The problem with standing in front of somebody's house and showing up on an saying, I ain't leaving, that's loitering. So all of a sudden, one of my neighbors calls the popo, and the popo come, and they take Manny to jail right as I'm pulling back into the house. And Manny goes, hold up, there he is. He knows me. He knows me. He knows me. And the officer's like, we're about to take him to jail. Do you know him? I say, officer, I have no idea what you're talking about. I ain't never seen him in my life. I'm like, no, I'm playing. Come back in. Come back in. Manny comes in the house. Come on in the house, Manny. Come up here. Come up here. Manny comes in. His car has broken down. He had to get an Uber. <laughs> he got arrested. Almost got a record. And now, he's in my house. He's going past the rock. I gotta know about that story. Tell me about the bird, the manure, the cow, the cat eats it. I said, oh man, are you still on that story? Oh, it's easy. Three lessons you gotta learn out of that story. Pastor Manning. Number one, not everybody that drops manure on you is your enemy. <laughs> Lesson number two, not everyone that pulls you out of manure is your friend. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Lesson number three, and the most important, when you're in manure, keep your mouth shut and you better not tweet anything. <laughs> That's the lesson. Watch this. You know why he got a revelation? It's because he sought it out. The rest of you were satisfied with going home to eat, but there was something about that story that made Manny say, I gotta know more. I gotta seek it out. I gotta dig it out. This is why Jesus told parables. He told parables because the thing you must understand about every parable is that the truth is concealed within the story. And Jesus wanted to know, are you desperate enough to seek it out? Or are you satisfied with just getting a miracle and just getting the surface? Or are you ready to go deeper and get the revelation? And only disciples get the revelation. Oh, if you want to be a part of the crowd, stay a part of the crowd. But you will never have a depth of relationship with God. But disciples say, I want more than just the surface. I want depth. Disciples say, I want more than just a miracle. I want the man that does the miracle. I'll do whatever it takes. This is why. This is why Jesus told stories. He wanted to see, would you seek out the truth? Because the principle of the parable, the principle of the story is no truth is yours until you discover it. No truth is yours until you take the time to unearth it. And Jesus gave the secret of the story to the disciples. You know why? Because they were the only ones that were still around and close enough to get it. The crowd was cool to see a show. The crowd was cool which is coming to church and only opening up the word of God when the preacher opens up the word of God. The crowd was cool with just listening to podcasts and listening to other people preach. But the disciples say, I want more. Hear me, God will reveal secrets to those who will seek him. If you want the secret, you got to be willing to seek him. 
You've got to move beyond the surface, fundamental level of just coming to church and only worshiping here and hearing a cute word. If you want the secrets, you must seek him. I'm afraid a lot of us want secrets and intel information, and we will not seek him. We won't get desperate enough to get it. God will give you information to the level of your interest. He will give you information to the level of your interest. If there is no interest, ooh, you will have limited information. So he says to his disciples, guess what? You're going to get the best kept secret. It's as if Jesus was retweeting Psalm 25. I love what Psalm 25 says. This is a good one right here. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. and He will show them his covenant. God gives secret information to those who are willing to go through the process to hear what he has to say. Look at your neighbor and say, you could get some secrets if you would take the time to seek him. Tell your other neighbor, say, other neighbor, you would get some secrets. You would know who to date. Oh, let that one sink in. Look at your other neighbor and say, you know what job to take if you actually took the time to seek him. Hear me, hear me. God will give you information to the level of your interest. This is a problem because we live in a culture that is completely antithetical to the kingdom. Everything is opposite. Have you noticed in the kingdom of God, it's always hashtag opposite day. Always is, always is. K kingdom, kingdom, you want to get high? Guess what? You got to go low. In this world, what do you got to do? Oh, you climb all the way to the top, kick everybody on the way down. The kingdom is always antithetical to the kingdom of this world. In the kingdom, you want to be the greatest? You got to be the least. In this world, somebody make you mad? Tell them what you really think. Speak in a tongue that needs no interpretation. In the kingdom, you got to forgive and then take it a whole nother level. Pray for those who persecuted. When was the last time you prayed <laughs> for one of your enemies? Some of y'all still stuck on what they put on your page six weeks ago. You realize the kingdom is completely opposite to the kingdom of this world. And God says, if you want the intel, you've got to seek him. And that's what trips me out about this message. Because God says, I'm only going to give secrets to those who are close enough to get it. And he tells this story, this fundamental story of a seed. He says, the kingdom is like a seed. He, he said, it's like a, do I, let me make sure I have it. Did I lose it? No. Yeah, I got it. He says, the kingdom is like a sower who sowed seed. By the way, this is one of the only parables and stories that Jesus ever explained. And he basically says that the seed, he gives us the answer, is the word of God. That the word is like a seed. Think of the power of a seed and the fragility of a seed. This seed right here has incredible power. Think about an acorn. A little acorn, I got two options with it. I can give it to the squirrel that is in my house. <laughs> you know about this, right? I have a, I don't, my wife and my children have a pet squirrel in my home. I could take that acorn and give it to a squirrel. I could take that same acorn, plant it in my backyard, and an oak tree will show up. God says, my word is the seed. Watch this. So my word works just like a seed. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. This doesn't seem to line up with current day church because we always talk about change, have you noticed in church, in snaps. Like God does it instant. Pow, tonight is your breakthrough. Tonight. It's going to happen. Not tomorrow. Ooh, nah. 
Isn't that what we always say? That's what we shout about. That's what, ain't nobody ever shouted, ooh, 20 years from now, you gonna get the promise you've been waiting for. When, nobody shouts about the time frame being long. But yet God says, my word, in order for it to work, it's like a, not a snap, a seed. But here's what's crazy. Can you help me that? That, yeah. Let me show you how God works, how his word works. I'm not going to throw this on the ground. <laughs> Nobody shout it. <laughs> you want to feel a, ah! but the kingdom works. Watch, let me show you. Let's see if you can even hear it. You can't even hear the thing drop. The word that will change my life. Once it put in, it's put in. It's a, now I gotta talk to it, especially us. You know, I'm, hey, I, I speak in tongues more than you all. I'm all for all of the charismatic spirit, but it. Wow. Nothing's changed. And yet, because of that moment, everything can change. Wow. Nothing happened when I dropped the seed in. But because I dropped the seed in, it now has the potential for every single thing to change. Maybe we need to change the timeline on some of the things we've been waiting to produce in our lives. Because you've been leaving services going, I mean, well, I just sang night and day. I mean, where is it at? <laughs> and I've never seen something sprout up right after it was put in. They call this the parable of the seed. And sometimes they call it the parable of the sower. I want to talk about the sower just for a second. Because you know who the sower is. I ought to be sure that whenever I preach, I'm just throwing seed. Throwing seed. I think anybody that shares your story, you're throwing seed. Throwing seed. But... Think about how we plant seed. We only plant seed typically in places that we think it will grow. That's how we plant. So the sower can't just be us. So it has to be somebody else. His name is Jesus. Because only Jesus would throw seed in areas that don't even look like they have potential. To Who throws seed on the sidewalk? That's what the pathway was. Who throws seed in areas that you know? No, it's not going to produce. This is grace in this story right here because God says even though the area doesn't look like it's going to produce because I'm a God that is slow to anger, that has loving kindness, I'm just going to throw it anywhere in the host that somehow, some way you will receive this word because I know if this word could just get in the right soil, something will happen. I want to take a little praise break and thank God that when other people have to do a soil test first, not Jesus. He says, I got grace. I'm just going to throw seed out. And whoever can just get a hold of this seed, you can come and encounter him. Just throwing it. Almost wasting it. Ooh, throwing it on the sidewalk. That's concrete, Jesus. I know. But I just want to give him a chance. That's the grace of God. I'm so glad when other people write you off, God loves you enough to just throw it. You're going to throw it towards them? Yeah, I know they got a record, but I'm just, I just, I want to, I just want to throw it. And no, I know she ain't been to church in a while, but I know she high at the pop-up service. That's why I just want to, in the hopes, in the hopes that just somehow, somehow, the seed will take plan. The only consistent thing in the story was the seed and the sower. The only thing that varied was the soil. So if you're in here today or watching at home, you're saying, hey, that's real cute, Pastor Robert. Look at me. Look at, look at me. I tried the church thing. I, I, pff, I know it all. I've been there. I've done that. I stepped out on faith and nothing happened. I believe you. I, I'm 
argue that. I will not argue that the seed was planted and nothing happened. I will argue if you say that there is something wrong with the sower or the seed. Because the sower and the seed is consistent. The only thing that changed is the soil. So fruit in the kingdom has nothing to do with the seed of the sower, but everything to do with the type of soil. 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 Can you put that word up there? Soil. Soil. Keep it up there. Soil. Are there any farmers in here? If you're a farmer, stand up. Come on. Farmersonly.com. Any farmer? No? I don't think so. Not a single farmer. All right. I, I figured, I figured there wasn't going to be no farmers. So you're looking at soil, you can't connect. That's what I did too. I looked at soil. I said, I can't connect with the soil. You know, God speaks to me in the illustration. He said, well, if you can't connect, take out the I and put in a U. Soul. Soil is your soul. Because when I put my faith in Jesus, can we go back to the basics? My spirit that was dead comes alive. Immediately. The moment I put my faith in him, that which was dead comes alive. Immediately. My body, not so much. Don't you wish? Oh, God, I wish. Don't you wish that once you put your faith in Jesus, like immediately, gut to six pack. I'm like, whew. Body don't change. Don't get my new body till heaven. But my soul, that has to be changed through a process. In my soul, I have thought patterns that have accumulated over my life, systems of sin I've been stuck in. Sin that has been done to me is all in my soul. And my soul, just like the soil, must be tended. You ever seen a weed just pop up? Just something you didn't plant. Like I've seen some in my backyard, four feet tall. Didn't plant nothing, just psh, there. Yeah, that's that crazy in you that just pop, pops up. It's, it's your soul. It must be tended. It must be cultivated. So he gives us four different souls, if you will, that are in this room tonight. I'm going to give them to you in three minutes. It's four souls, four soils. Listen to me right now. Number one. This is the calloused soul. Somewhere in here is a callous soul. Let's look at it. It says, some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. It's a calloused soul. Because there was the pathway that had been trampled on by the people that walked. And so because the ground was so hard, whenever the seed would hit the ground, the bird could just come pick it up. In fact, birds would look for people that were throwing seed. That's why y'all want to, oh, I feel like call the ministry. Be careful as you throw seed because the birds, which later we find out is the enemy, he's looking for people that throw seed. I got an anointing. All right, watch out for them birds because they're coming. And the birds wait for the seed that hits the hard ground. So it's a callous soul. Do you have a calloused soul? It's the worst people to preach to. Because they think. <laughs> Heart so hard. Been there, done that. It's not somebody that's questioning, that has genuine questions about faith. It's somebody that's already decided they're not going to believe. It's somebody that religion is going, I, pff, I've been there. You're critiquing. You've been critiquing the service the whole night. Yeah, mm, well, you know. If I was singing it, I'd sing it better. I pre it, it's a callous soul. And your heart has become so hard, the word can't get in. The next soul is a shallow soul. Shallow soul. Let's look at it. It says, uh, others like the seed sown on rocky places hear the word at once and receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Ooh, I, I'm going to be honest. 
shallow souls are not like callous souls. You don't want to preach to a callous soul because they're. But a shallow soul, whoo, you love to preach to them because they're like, oh, hallelujah. Oh, that's good. You ever met that person? As soon as they got to say, I- I'll serve on any team. Where you want me? Parking lot? Kids? Where you want me? I'll be there. Have you seen that person? They had the, for every prayer meeting, oh, thank you, God, thank you, God. They're so excited. And then about like four months later, you'll be like, where was, where is, what the, what the, shallow soul. Got real excited when they put their faith in Jesus. Like, ooh, I put my faith in him. I got a job. Ooh, I put my faith in him. My kids are acting good. Ooh, I put my faith in him. I got a raise. But let the raise leave. Let the kids start acting like Chucky or Freddy Krueger. Let, <laughs> let stuff start going down. And all of a sudden, it's shallow. It says the rocky soil. And I thought the rocks were on top. The rock is at the bottom underneath the soil that looks like it'll take it. But as soon as it hits the rock, it can't go deep. Do you have a shallow soul? You know, got a shallow soul. If the moment God doesn't perform the way you wanted him to perform, you're out. Because you approach God like it's an agreement. It's a contract. Look, I worship. Where's my breakthrough? Ain't that how this works? And the moment he doesn't perform, you're out. The moment you have persecution, you're out. The moment your friend circle has to change because now you've put your faith in him, you're out. It's a shallow soul. Third one, I'm done. The crowded soul. It says, still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The worried, the worries of this life choke out the word. That's the crowded soul. The crowded soul is interesting because you have too much Jesus in you to feel satisfied in the world. But you have too much world in you (laughs) to be satisfied by Jesus only. (laughs) So because your soul is so crowded, the worries of this life choke out. Some of you, your whole spiritual life would change with something as simple as getting off of the gram. Wow. <gasps> Thank you, God. God forbid you just are not on it or put a timer straight for how long you've been on it. Yeah. But as you're scrolling, here come the worries and the seed is getting choked by the worries. What are you worried about? Is it choking what God would do in your life? One writer said, worry is like paying interest on a debt that you might not ever have to pay. Because you're so worried about this, worried about that. It says the deceitfulness of wealth and money can choke out the word because it's a crowded soul. Last soul, the fruitful soul. It says others like seed sown on good soil. Here we go. Hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown, the fruitful soul. Worship team, join me. Any person that would have heard Jesus telling that story, as soon as he talked about that fruitful soil or soul, and as soon as they heard 30 or 60 or 100 fold, their ears would have perked up. I just read it, you're like, what, what, what is fold? There's less laundry. What are you talking about? But any person hearing that story, their mind would have been blown. Because to plant a seed, you would maybe get sevenfold at the most. But 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold? That was unheard of. That must mean that if I will tend to my soul, the seed of the word is so supernatural that if I will take care of my soul, the seed will do the rest. This is a supernatural word that has the power.
to change your life if it could just get deep enough and if it could just stay and be cultivated. Ain't nothing happen. How many of us are looking at our lives like this? Frustrated. Not watering, but frustrated. Steady on Netflix. <laughs> but Jesus. No wonder. The seed is on him. The soil is on you. How is your soul? I am the only one that is responsible for the transformation of my soul through the process, through the process of sanctification, of allowing the same Spirit of God that changed me in a moment through time, through getting in the Word, through community, He transforms my soul. How's your soul tonight? Here's what I love about the sower. He doesn't give up. You know his love for you because he throws it out to anyone. And I felt like God told me to preach this message for somebody who's about to walk away from what could happen in your life. And you're thinking, ah, oh, the seed didn't work. It did. But you have check your soul in every single scenario the seed never got deep enough to get there if you think the seed's gonna get deep enough just for you coming to church once a week occasionally reading the word it's just old school stuff there's no way the reason the disciples got the revelation the secret is because they were still around to get it that's why it's the best kept secret. Wow. Has to be kept. I'm not saying you won't go through challenges. I mean, they saw him die and they thought all hope was lost. And even in that moment where they walked away and they're locked in a room thinking, he's not what he said, he's gone. Here he is, three days later, fulfilling every promise, walking through the wall, saying, look at my hands, look at my feet. You know what I'm believing tonight? Some of you that have walls up and your soul has become so callous, Jesus is going to walk up in here today, saying, here I am. Come back, open up your heart again. Trust me again. Believe me again. Don't doubt the power of the seed and don't doubt the grace of the sower. God says, tonight is your night to say, God, here I am. I'm opening up my soul again to you. I want to be transformed. I want to be changed. God, I know I quit and I know I walked away, but how many of you tonight say, I'll come back to you because I know you still got the power to transform and redeem my soul. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father, tonight we do what the song says. We open up our heart to you again. God, I thank you that you're a gracious, gracious, gracious sower. God, that you're always throwing seed. Lord, even tonight for somebody in this room, somebody watching at home, this message is seed again. Lord, I'm not naive to the enemy. I know, I know he waits for the word to be taken. He puts lies in our mind that it's too late. That it didn't work, but God, thank you that your word is true. The seed is powerful. But God, would you give us the perseverance? Would you give us the patience? Increase our trust and our faith to watch what has been planted. 
come into fruition. God, thank you that the seed is supernatural, that it can produce the harvest that the world has never seen. God, would you give us the strength to trust even when we don't feel it? Even when we don't see it. But to know that the seed was planted. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Can y'all put that James scripture up? I forgot to say it, but I want you to have some weapons to fight the enemy with. Look at what James says to believers. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God. The word God has planted in our hearts for it has the power to save your souls. That's James writing not to heathens, to believers saying let the seed do its work. Seed has the power, but the condition of the soul and the soil is on you. Whoever you have to cut off, it's worth cutting them off. Whatever you got to do to talk to a counselor, it's worth talking to a counselor. It's worth putting scriptures on your mirror and putting it all over the mirror to where you can't even hardly see your face in the morning. But you're seeing the word of God because you know when you step into that workplace, you're going to be bombarded with all kinds of things that's going to stir up in your soul and going to trigger things from childhood. But start off your day declaring the whatever it takes to cultivate the soil. Because the seed, it will work. Would you bow your heads all over this place? Those of you at home, I want to always give this opportunity for somebody to come home. We say it all the time at social, you can always come home. For some of you listening to this message in this room, social at home, you, you've given your life to Jesus, but you need to be committed to the continual work of working on your soul. But there's some of you that have never taken the first step, which is say, Jesus, I am yours. You do not have to get yourself together to come to him. You come to him just as you are. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, I don't care if it's just one person, you're worth it. You say, Pastor Rob, would you include me in this closing prayer? I need to surrender my life give him my heart my mind my soul you've heard the seed of the word tonight just got to make a decision whether you're going to accept it if that's you would you just lift up your hand high enough long enough to where I could see it just high enough long enough yeah yeah thank you God thank you thank you God thank you. I'm talking to some of you who you need to recommit or rededicate God's calling you back that's why that's why you had to hear this yeah just lift it up you can put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you social at home, right where you are, God's presence knows no limits. Right there in your living room, right there in that connect group, God can encounter you just saying, God, I, I surrender today. Anybody else? Can we pray this prayer just as one big family, one big family today? We're all going to pray it, but especially those of you who responded. Come on, say this from your heart. Say, Jesus, thank you so much for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for living the life that I was supposed to live, for dying the death that I was supposed to die. You took my place. So, Lord, today, I receive the seed of your word that has the power to save my soul. Lord, I give you everything. I cannot do life without you. You are my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. From this moment forward, I'm walking with you. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Come on, if you meant what you prayed, would you give God praise? Come on, you can do better than that. Can we give... King Jesus and pray.